when the grid goes down, most folks reach for candles and extra blankets and uh, just hope for the best. But what our grandparents and great-grandparents did was, well, very different. They didn't heat rooms first and bodies second. They heated the bed itself, deliberately, efficiently, and with methods refined over centuries. This design wasn't some old folklore or just a comfort ritual, no sir. It was applied thermal strategy, and it still works today if you understand how it was built and why each layer mattered. The bed itself was treated as a heat retention system, not just a piece of furniture. In the pre-electric world, the bed was designed to trap and stabilize heat for 8 to 10 hours, not just provide softness. Frames were usually wood, never metal, because wood doesn't wick heat away from the body. Beds were often slightly raised up to avoid the ground cold, but not so high that drafts could circulate underneath. In many regions, folks used closed or boxed bed frames that reduced airflow, basically turning the sleeping space into a low-volume heat chamber. You can actually apply this today by avoiding metal bed frames during outages and, you know, placing a dense rug, folded blanket, or even flattened cardboard under the bed to block cold air movement. This alone can raise perceived warmth quite a bit without adding any actual heat source. The mattress layers were chosen for insulation before comfort. Pre-electric mattresses weren't just foam slabs, nope. They were layered systems. Folks packed straw, chaff, wool, horsehair, or shredded cloth tightly to trap air and prevent convection. The goal was slow heat loss, not softness. Wool was especially prized since it insulates even when it's a bit damp and resists compression over time. So, a modern application is, uh, pretty straightforward. You can replace or supplement those foam mattresses with wool toppers, dense cotton futons, or just some layered blankets stitched together. Now, during outages, placing an insulating layer right under your body actually matters more than just piling up blankets on top. Heat loss downward is often ignored, but, you know, historically it was always addressed first. The sheet and blanket order? Well, it followed a strict kind of thermal logic. Linen sheets were used closest to the body since they wicked moisture without, uh, collapsing the insulation. Wool blankets came next, usually in multiple thin layers instead of just one thick one. Heavy quilts or coverlets went on top to help suppress air movement. The weight there was intentional. Compression reduced convective heat loss while also stabilizing the trapped warm air. In practical terms, during a blackout, you really ought to layer thin blankets instead of relying on a single comforter. Try to use natural fibers whenever you can. Synthetic materials, they trap moisture and collapse that insulation. Weight does matter, but only if you've got breathable layers underneath it. Now, the heated element folks used back then was always external and temporary, never something that stayed all night. Bed warmers, filled with hot coals, stones, or even boiling water, were tucked in between the layers for a short spell, then pulled out before anyone climbed in. This little trick of precharging the bedding would raise the thermal baseline of the mattress and blankets, so your own body heat could keep things cozy all night long. These days, you can get the same effect by putting a hot water bottle between your blankets about 20 minutes before you hit the hay. Heck, even heated bricks wrapped in a cloth will work just fine and are safe too. The important thing is to take them out before you go to sleep. Back in the day, folks avoided continuous heat sources since they upped the fire risk and dried out the air, making things less comfortable overall. In colder parts of the world, folks often enclosed their beds with heavy curtains or even built them right into wall alcoves. This clever setup meant there was a lot less air to warm up and it kept those pesky drafts at bay. With just your own body heat, you could raise the temperature inside those cozy spaces by several degrees above the rest of the room. You can recreate this by uh, positioning the bed against an interior wall hanging thick blankets or curtains on the exposed sides or even using a temporary canopy frame. The goal here isn't decoration, but controlling airflow. Less air movement means less heat loss, plain and simple. Clothing and sleep posture, well, they were part of the whole system. 
Folks didn't sleep naked in unheated rooms, no sir. Linen nightshirts, wool socks, and sometimes caps were just standard. Extremities lose heat the fastest, so covering them up preserved core warmth. Now, sleep posture mattered too. Side sleeping reduced the exposed surface area compared to lying flat. For modern use, you'll want to avoid tight clothing that restricts circulation. Instead, use loose wool or cotton layers. And if you need to, cover your head lightly. These weren't just comfort preferences, they were survival adjustments, you know, refined through experience. The room was prepared to support the bed, not the other way around. Before sleep, doors were closed, shutters sealed, and fires allowed to burn down rather than die suddenly. Residual warmth was managed, not wasted. Cold air infiltration was treated as the enemy. Beds were positioned away from windows and chimneys, never in line with drafts. During outages, closing unused rooms, sealing door gaps with towels, and sleeping in the smallest viable space follows the same logic. The bed system only works if the surrounding environment isn't actively stripping heat away. This approach does not depend on fuel supply, electricity, or modern infrastructure. It relies on physics that hasn't changed, insulation, airflow control, moisture management, and thermal mass. When done correctly, a pre-electric heating bed allows safe deep sleep even in freezing conditions with no active heat source overnight. For survivalists, this means reduced dependency on generators and heaters. For historians, it's a reminder that domestic design once prioritized function over convenience, and that knowledge was lost not because it failed, but because electricity made it seem unnecessary. If this kind of practical historical knowledge matters to you, subscribe to Echoes of Survival and share this with others who understand that the past still has answers the modern world forgot.